Have you ever wondered why some projects seem to have more impact than others, or watched a successful project fail to create lasting impact? I have, and it is one of the reasons my work focuses on learning and integration to inform projects, which is why after coordinating and evaluating the Search Development Alliance between CSIRO and DFAT, I, I decided to undertake a PhD. Hello, my name is Shona Mahag. I'm an integration scientist at CSIRO, and today I wanted to share some of the insights from my PhD, which are now being incorporated into projects both in Australia and overseas. So change is fast. Billions of dollars um, are being channeled into development interventions every year with the um, goal of lifting people out of poverty. While there's been much progress, arguably there's a lot more that we could all be doing. It's never been a more important time to learn faster, both individually and collectively, so that we can make better decisions. So how do we get better at what we do? And how do we help others on their journey? Since entering the research for development domain with the commencement of the Alliance in 2007, I have watched projects both succeed and fail to achieve on-ground impact almost independently of the quality of the science involved. I became increasingly interested in what makes our work stick over the longer term and how we can improve project design and implementation to improve our path to impact, as well as how to get better at evaluating and learning from that impact. As such, in 2015, I undertook a PhD part-time while continuing to work full-time, which was a little crazy, but it also allowed me to work with partners over a longer time frame, enabling us to track change at the conclusion of the Alliance and several years afterwards. The Alliance sought to help build a shared understanding about how to respond to complex challenges related to climate change, water management, food security, and sustainable cities in the Asia-Pacific region. In addition to building knowledge, these projects sought to grow the capacity, competencies and networks of partners and key stakeholders with the projects, priming them to catalyze change. I want to share with you what I learned about the change agents in four of the Alliance projects. So who are these change agents? They are individuals or groups that have the will and the capacity to enact change. They are sometimes called champions, positive deviants, brokers, facilitators. Whatever we want to call them, What's important is their capacity or agency to influence based on their experiences and perceptions. The perceptions held by the society, structures and circumstances that they're in. But rather than a heroic figure leading the charge, I think of them as part of the dynamics of transformation. I'm sure all of us know change agents in our lives. You might even be one yourself. I was interested in understanding through our projects how to help enable these people to make better decisions and do what they needed to do. So my conceptual framework acknowledged that our projects were part of a broader context, which is the gray lines. The projects were represented by the square box and the agents that I was looking at are represented by the circles of their networks, their characteristics and their competencies. Projects we were working with them helped build their knowledge, their networks and their capability to enable going through pathways, navigating barriers, leading to anticipated change in the system and the agents themselves. I don't have time today to tell you much about the case studies in detail, I'm just focusing on the change agents. So the following is just a very brief overview of the collaborative multi-partner project led by my CSIRO colleagues. The yellow um, project, it was a, that high level resolution downscaling in Vietnam. The idea was to inform Vietnam's national and provincial climate action plans with evidence from updated scenarios underpinning adaptation planning and prioritizing investments. The orange and the green boxes are two sister projects, one in Kanto, Vietnam, and the other in Makassar, Indonesia. These projects are about water and wastewater infrastructure, which would be impacted by climate change and other key drivers. So we wanted to see what adaptive urban planning responses could support future decision-making for infrastructure investments. And the fourth one in the red was an adaptive livelihoods project in Indonesia looking at vulnerability of local livelihoods under climate change. My first task was to explore if the projects had made a change and look before looking at what the individuals had done. The theory of change for the three projects had three connected and overlapping stages as shown in this diagram. The stage one, which was the orange, project activities aimed to build the capacity of the research team and partners by collating data and developing tools 
and carrying out participatory planning and training that enabled in-country partners to have increased understanding of the issues. Stage two, or the blue boxes, were around policy and program development, where engagement was facilitated by research teams and partners, enabling to more informed decision-making. And stage three, the green boxes, involved implementation adoption, scaling up and scaling out by the research team partners and beneficiaries. The projects were evaluated um, at project completion in 2014, one year later in 2015, and for a third time as part of my PhD in 2017. A mixed method evaluation was used involving participatory reflection workshops and stakeholder adaptive capacity surveys. Where possible, we engage the same people at each evaluation slice. This process helped me understand what impact the projects had, identify potential change agents, and fit, interview them for better understanding what was driving them and how they could contribute to change and how the project had helped them, if at all. My review of the literature and interview results suggested that key change agent characteristics could be divided into four main themes, values and beliefs, mastery concepts, entrepreneurship or creativity, and relationships and networks. I also learned that being a change agent is time and context dependent, much like evaluations are a snapshot in time. People become a change agent for a particular task or purpose and then ease out of the role. Agents are not necessarily change agents in all aspects of their lives. They might be an agent of change at home, at work or in their community, but not necessarily all or all at the same time. In addition to characteristics, agents required competencies for change. Competencies combine skills with abilities, behaviours and values to create a certain know-how. My review of the literature started with sustainability sciences and then branched out to include other intervention domains such as education, medicine and others. In the end, my research suggested 12 competencies for potential change agents or collectives, which can be loosely clumped into three broad overlapping and interconnected. Group of people, learning skills and adaptation competencies. Whereas characteristics are more about values and orientation, competencies are very much about skills and capacities and practice. It is also important to note that each identified agent didn't have all of the characteristics or competencies. They worked with others for the attributes they were missing or they needed. However, all of them did have to have good interpersonal and learning skills. My research confirmed that characteristics of agents influence which competence they had and what they would cultivate, but also which competency an agent started with would very much influence an agency's character. This process is neatly summarized by Professor Brian Little's concept of personal projects, where people can choose to act out of character to achieve an objective, which in turn can influence their character. For example, an introvert who dislikes public speaking intensely but knows it's important for their work and work on being more engaging in their presentations. This doesn't stop me from being an introvert, but over time, I'm likely to develop more extroverted attributes. But how did this all play out for the agents in my case studies? And what roles did the projects play in this? To varying degrees, each project created lasting change within their context. They grew the skills and competencies of those involved and of themselves as well. The growth in skills, competencies and networks led to further opportunities with some gaining advancement for themselves or the institution, getting new projects or choosing to work more closely with end users of their research. However, it was those who appeared as a strong emerging or prospective agents who used these competencies to strengthen and grow their characteristics that led to lasting change. In part, this was due to their strong values and purpose, which they had already aligned to the goals of their project. Another unifying feature was the importance or growing importance of mastery and learning in their lives, which reinforced through formal training by the projects, but also more subtly and perhaps more impactfully through the informal mentoring and relationships built through the projects. Many of the pre-existing or strong change agents already had several characteristics and were quick to cultivate competencies, although no one agent had them all. In fact, it's the ones who were self-aware enough to recognize their gaps and were able to partner with others who registered as the strongest change agents. In this example, the pre-existing change agent almost had all of the characteristics um, and many of the competencies shown by the dark circles. The lighter gray highlights what changed through the project. 
The project expanded their already developed network. The slight change here was working more effectively with groups like the government and with other farmers. Most critically for enabling climate adaptation activities, the adaptation competencies were completely novel. In particular, systems thinking competency was seen as a personal transformation. It has now been incorporated as a regular tool in their work. An emerging change agent is someone who already has some of the characteristics with strengths and some of the attributes, but continues to grow their knowledge, capabilities, and networks. In this example, an emerging change agent um, used the project to widen their network and learn how to work with others. Again, many of the adaptation competencies were completely novel, as well as were the competencies of evaluation and learning. A key personal insight with this connection between the social and the ecological creating a shift in values towards the environment and subsequently creative tendencies on how to communicate this connection to others. Like the strong change agent, the most substantive change was the development of the adaptation competencies, the implementation of which was assisted by their new networks. Frozen, here we go, perspective. A prospective change agent is someone who actively seeks to grow their knowledge, capabilities, and networks. The case study evaluations highlighted that these individuals were at the beginning of their careers, with colleagues and partners suggesting a bright future based on their project contributions. This prospective change agent had a strong passion for their work. As they were mostly an early career researcher at the project commencement, they had small, mostly academic network. The project expanded their networks both within their own institution as well as with others, including international researchers. They grew most of the non-existent adaptation competencies and learned who and how to partner to address their gaps. Unlike the previous strong and emerging change agents, this agent went through a significant change in multiple competencies, leading to a shift in mindset and a desire to undertake further education. There were project and cultural differences about how prospective emerging and strong agents perceive their future and their role in shaping it, yet some characteristics were shared across the change agents regardless of the project or context. These included the importance of learning in their lives, a sense of personal responsibility and purpose, and being driven by their sense of purpose or responsibility to go beyond and sometimes around their day job. Overall, the case study projects demonstrated that not all members of a team or community need to have all competencies, but not having these competencies can be just as limiting as the resources or knowledge. Learning and interpersonal competencies were the most important for all participants to have and to cultivate. In contrast, the adaptation competencies were the, the most new, with interviewees particularly appreciating systems thinking and seeing it as vital for adaptation decision-making and leading to change. Something to think about for research projects is that general competencies such as communication and administration, were often the most valued by prospective and emerging agents. And these were often assumed by the project team, leading to slow starts and the challenge of boundaries of capacity building, particularly for research agencies like CSIRO. In all four case studies, the CSIRO teams were seen as enablers of networks and sources and connectors of information, empowering organizations and individuals to collaborate who had never done so before. Critically, in addition to knowledge, resources, and competencies, Agents felt that it was a two-way mentoring and social interactions together with formal training and ongoing participatory evaluation that helped catalyze change in their contexts. This suggests that people matter with more genuine relationships needed between researchers, partners, and practitioners. We also need to think about capacity building being more than technical knowledge and skills. This should also focus on developing the necessary competencies for change. Cultivating potential change agents' sense of personal responsibility and purpose as well as providing them with the skills and knowledge, increases the likelihood of enduring success. My research demonstrated that change agents are important to the success of an adaptation intervention, and they are a key part of why systemic change happens. So that's where my PhD finished, but the work going forward, we're going to trial testing some of these by teaching people the competencies in an upcoming program in the Pacific. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Siona, and thank you especially for keeping on time. Um, we have two questions, uh, and I think if we're quick, we, we may be able to answer both. Um, so the first one is around uh, if it's more important to try and identify specific change agents at the start of a project 
and then to target effort towards supporting them? Or can a more general approach of growing everyone's networks um, be better and allow the change agent um, to emerge? I think the second is definitely the approach that I would take. If you focus on individuals, you, you lead to potentially maladaptive outcomes. At best, those, those individuals will grow their capacities and competencies, and then they leave to get better opportunities, which case the context that you're in now has an even bigger capacity gap. But actually, everybody has the potential to be a change agent. So I think that um, the skills and competencies that I've outlined are useful for everyone, not just in adaptation projects, but in other aspects of their lives. And one of the aspects that came out was that it was often clusters of these people rather than individuals themselves that actually made the change happen. Wonderful, thank you. And, then, and a second question was around, um, perhaps why do people find it difficult to maintain um, change character in society is the question. So I think the question is around, you know, that it seems like you understand it anyway. So, so why can't we always be change agents? I think the easy answer is it's exhausting. <laughs> and that um, you need to be able to recharge. Um, it's not something that we can always be going. It's not to say that we can't aspire to be change agents and that people dip in and out of. Perhaps the strongest change agent who pre-existed prior to the projects described it as as a journey that meandered and that at times windows of opportunity opened up and he had the skills and resources to enact the change that he could do. And then, and then he went back to his sort of normal role in his job and his society until the next opportunity came through. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you again for a fascinating um, presentation. Um, part of my own research is around learning and teaching in development. Um, and so I will follow up with you because Part of what we're trying to do in, in learning and teaching and development is to cultivate change agents. So these, these questions of core skills and competencies, I think, is really important. Thank, okay, you. thank you very much. Thank you. OK, let's move on um, then to our second speaker now. And um, as I said at the beginning of the um, event, if the second speaker could please introduce himself, I think that would be helpful. Excellent. Can everyone hear me and see my screen? Yes, please. Excellent. So I'm going to get started. My name is Daniela, but my friends and family call me Danny. So feel free to call me Danny. I'm a PhD student with the University of the Sunshine Coast, associated with them through the Australian Centre for Pacific Island Research. And I'm also part of CSIRO with the Food Systems and Global Change Research Group. So this um, presentation that I'm going to guide you through is one of my um, sort of like articles that came out of my PhD. I'm in the final stressful stages of my PhD in the middle of a lockdown, but it's so great. So um, I wanted to, um, after introducing myself, also introduce some of the collaborators that worked with me in this project. So one of them is Dr. Patrick Nunn. He's my supervisor, also from USC. Harriet Beasley, also from USC and two important collaborators from the University of the South Pacific, Joji Sivo and Joeli Veitayaki. So Nisan Bulevinaka to all the Fijian uh, friends in the audience. So what this um, project was about is a little bit connected to what Siona mentioned initially about having projects and, and climate change adaptation programs being implemented, fu funds being funneled, uh, throughout all the Pacific, but this sense of frustration of not knowing, okay, what is actually working out? And do we actually know that uh, these changes can be sustained and that these investments are actually uh, making substantial transformations in this community? So it was sort of like through that mindset that we approached this project. So I think you might be familiar with some of this uh, most prevalent narrative in the Pacific that these islands are drowning, that these are incredibly exposed and vulnerable places. As you can see in some snapshots that I just took um, from the internet, it's a narrative that talks about the need to support, the need to come and rescue these places and these islands. But I'd like you to at least leave this session or this presentation with a bit of a different perspective. And that is that, yes, these places are at risk, Yes, there's a lot of vulnerabilities, but there's also a lot of capacity. And there's a lot of, as Siona mentioned, a lot of agents of change 
that are operating in these really remote environments, uh, just trying to change this narrative and trying to uh, create change from their own sort of like governance systems and their own communities. And that was the perspective that, that I wanted to highlight and that I really wanted to focus in my research. So the aim of this project was to understand what are the underlying conditions and challenges that must be considered uh, when you want to achieve sustainable climate change adaptation initiatives in peripheral communities in the Pacific. And when I talk peripheral, I mean really peripheral. So these are locations that are eight to 10 hours boat rides from city centers. So these are like systems that are very much self-governing because of the geographic characteristics in which they operate. So think of it as, as you live in your home, you go to a supermarket, if there's an incident of crime, you call the police, you have all these services that are sort of like external to you that you can uh, rely on. But in these communities, you have to think every single aspect of living in these places is self-managed just because there's simply no viable logistic uh, resource that you could call the police and the police will come and solve a crime. So everything that happens in these villages and these communities is pretty much managed and governed by the communities themselves. So this is a little bit of a conceptual framework that we use to place our research and place our sort of like understanding of how these projects work. So I'll be talking to you um, and, and this case study that we developed was just trying to understand how a climate adaptation project that has been ongoing for more than 20 years in one of these very remote villages have actually been able to succeed over time or to remain in time and what are sort of like the lessons learned in the process. So when you talk about climate adaptation, there's many ways in which a project can be framed. Um, usually you can have this spectrum of initiatives that are mainly development driven, but have some co benefits uh, for adaptation, then you can also sort of like mainstream climate ch change adaptation objectives into development objectives or development projects. And you can do very targeted adaptation strategies that are basically aimed at just tackling risks or hazards. So as you move in this sort of like spectrum of different type of initiatives, obviously the more you move towards the right, you need the more information and specialized sort of like knowledge of the system and how climate change is gonna impact the system. So in this spectrum, you would also respond with different sort of like type of strategies. So when you're working in sort of like development driven, you're mostly thinking about tackling vulnerabilities uh, as you move into mainstreaming, there's a little bit of building adaptive capacity or managing cl climate risks. And as you move completely to the other side of the scale, you focus on actually reducing the climate impacts. Um, but as I said, you would then have to have pretty precise knowledge of what those impacts are. And sometimes that's not feasible in, in most of the environments that we work in. Um, then there's several approaches to, to adaptation. I'm just mentioning a couple of the most common ones that are promoted in the Pacific, which is community-based adaptation and ecosystem-based adaptation. And within these approaches, uh, there's sort of like, you can think of different tiers of change and adaptation that occur. So most of you would be familiar with transformational adaptation, which means big substantial changes to the systems to be able to allow them to operate under new or projected um, climate conditions, plan adaptation. That means that it's something that's not happening sort of like spontaneously as a, as a planned process with a very concrete objective. Um, incremental adaptation, which means that the change occurs as the word says incrementally and, and, and in steps and then reactive or autonomous adaptation, which is basically just uh, reacting after each hazard or af after each uh, climatic event. So in this graph, I have marked with a star, basically all the components that these initiatives that I'm gonna talk to you about kind of falls into. And something that I wanna really highlight is like most of the research in the climate change adaptation area focuses a lot on understanding barriers and limits to adaptation. But what we wanted to do with this project is actually look at what are these contextual enabling conditions and challenge? Because no matter how 
you form these adaptation projects, they end up being projects or programs and initiatives, and they are kind of have to be embedded within this context that have their particular so, sort of conditions. And we believe that a lot of research has been done in understanding barriers and limits of adaptation per se, but we haven't done, been doing much but understanding the context in which adaptation takes place. And this is where we kind of situate our research in. So a little bit of a background of these places um, that we were studying. So this case study was developed in an island called Now. So it is the fifth largest inhabited island in Fiji. And as I said, it's about 80 kilometers east from Suva, the capital city. Uh, there's approximately 2000 people that inhabit the island. And we collected data in seven of the 16 villages. And the reason is because this project that I'm going to talk to you about started in the district of Vanuatu. So it's all the villages you see here with uh, red dot. So we um, interviewed uh, community members from all these villages. And then we included uh, villages from Dione and uh, Sawayeke because they are part of like districts that were included in the initiative as it started sort of like naturally expanding throughout the village. So we wanted to know, okay, what were the motivations and challenges and opportunities when the project was born and started and how did it expand naturally through across the island? So a little bit of background about the initiative. So initially the project was called Mositi Vanuasu. Uh, at the moment, it's called Lomani Ngao, and it means to care for now, the island. So initially, when the project was started, it had no climate change wording whatsoever. It was a rich reef approach, mainly focused on marine and land conservation. This project actually um, began with establishing community managed marine protected areas, some of the first uh, marine protected areas established in Fiji around 2005. And then the project, as I said, gradually started expanding across the island and expanding also in the types of activities that we're doing. So a lot of it evolved to more sort of like a sustainable livelihoods or development approach. And it is only until very recently, the past five years or so, that the project has been more act actively started talking and introducing concepts of climate change and climate change adaptation. So this is just a brief snapshot for you to have an idea of the types of activities that are conducted through the project. So as I said, it focuses on marine, land-based and coastal ecosystems. And at the current time, uh, there's big components of knowledge sharing and capacity building, uh, focus on developing and strengthening economic activities and a big focus on sort of like promoting and transforming agricultural activities to, through different small uh, projects. So for those of you who have not had the pleasure to be in Fiji and to do field work in Fiji, um, something that I guess get asked primarily by my family and my husband is, are you actually doing field work or are you on holidays? Because this is what, uh, a bit of what the photos that I send and what field work actually looks like. So it's a lot of walking around with members of the community, sitting around, having conversations, sharing many meals, and primarily being part of the community. So as I said, we go to these remote areas, we live with these families, as we conduct research, we embed ourselves in community life. It involves going to Sunday morning church and actually really understanding how life happens in these villages and how communities interact. So the methods that we used to collect data, this was a primarily qualitative study. So we used something that those of you familiar with the Fijian context is called Talano, which means just having an open dialogue and discussion uh, in the community. Most of this happened uh, around drinking kava, as you can see in one of the photos. Also one of the perks of doing research in the Pacific, just drinking kava all day long. Um, but there's also a perk with this, and there's something that needs to be understood. is like when we go to these communities and we try to organize these talanoas, they're very formal. So we usually would sit under uh, around a cava bowl with the chiefs. And as you can see in the photos, mostly males. So you sit with the chiefs, you sit with the elders, you sit with the people who have been leaders in the community. And you have those formal discussions. And 
there's ceremonies around it and it, and it is part of the process. You have to do that. But unfortunately, if you only do that, then you miss out on a lot of other perspectives. So for example, youth perspectives or female perspectives. So we also conduct a lot of what we like to call informal talanoas. And that's just basically sitting with the women when they're working and weaving mats and having these conversations as well on top of this sort of like formal community consultations. Um, a lot of it has to do with also understanding how the environment works. And in these villages, so there's not many roads uh, that connect each village. So everything has to do by votes. And unfortunately, that means working with the tides. So sometimes you leave in the morning, you plan to have three consultations, but then the tides change and you're stuck in the village and you can't leave. So I think this also plays in why we have such poor evaluation and understanding of projects because you have to go through all these kind of like hurdles of working in the field and working in these environments that are not really easily be accessible. So now I'm moving quickly into the results. And what we did is after these interviews and after trying to understand what is it that communities uh, really prioritize and what is it that made them engage in this initiative for such a long time, we came up with like four uh, very important themes. So the first one is trying to make an effort to understand what are the perceptions of environmental change and what influences them. So really understand what the community see is changing in the villages and what are the attributions in this in the settings. And in the villages that we were working on, there was a high level of awareness of climate change and how climate change is affecting the environment. And, and sort of like that attribution was really clear. But I, I think if you start a project without understanding what's that level of awareness and perceptions, then it's most likely that it's going to fail because people would not be able to make the connections between the activities that you're proposing and the problem that you're trying to tackle. Um, the second theme is centered about the need to present initiatives on centered of improving livelihoods. I, and I always make emphasis on this. If you go and talk to a farmer, the farmer is not going to talk to you in climate change adaptation concepts or resource management context. They're going to talk to you about the livelihoods, about what they matter to them, about their farming systems, and about how they want to improve these farming systems. So I think being able to translate these climate adaptation projects into tangible outcomes that are very much related to, to livelihoods and what people want to achieve from their systems, it is a, a big reason of success. And it is one of the reasons why I think this initiative has been um, sustained for so long in this case. Um, then again, knowing how to balance the external support with the need of uh, endogenous initiatives and motivation. So I put this picture here because this is a prime example, a day when we were going to do interviews. And then on that day, it was a day when the schools choose uh, their prefect. So they usually it's really funny because they have like four kids they're all like super naughty and cheeky, but they have to choose the most behaved one to be the prefect of the school. But what it means is like, actually it's a big event. The village is paralyzed, all the parents attend. It's a very emotional mo moment for parents because there's a sense of being proud for the kids in, in, in this responsibility that's given to the village. When the chief speaks, it speaks about the importance of being a leader in the community. So if you plan an activity that disregards these sort of situations in the village, then again, it's probably going to be unsuccessful because you're not being mindful of village life and what happens in the settings. And even though it seems like remote places where there's not much going on, there is a lot of things going on. And there is a lot of community involvement and community activities almost on a daily basis. And then finally, um, sort of uh, an important thing is theme that emerged in this research is like, how do we sustain transformation? And a key aspect is that a lot of projects will focus on awareness raising on capacity building at the beginning of the project. And as Siona mentioned, you have leaders who emerge, but then move on. So I think sort of like knowledge sharing and awareness is something that needs to be implemented all throughout the project because you have these natural changes uh, in communities and, and that sort of like knowledge needs to stay sort of alive, not only at the early stages of the project. 
Um, as I said before, any initiative that you do in this setting needs to be closely aligned with village plans. So in these settings, every village has its own village plan. So there's two days of the month where everyone goes and make, does maintenance of the gardens and cleans out the coconut leaves and so on. So there's actually a schedule of things plan, planned for the village. And if you're introducing a project or introducing an initiative, it needs to be very well aligned uh, with what's already happening and what, what's already planned. And something that I think it's often overlooked by development cooperation agencies and, and development projects is that you have to effectively engage culture, faith, and spirituality in the process. These are really important pillars in this setting. I put this photo here because every village to vi you visit, the first thing they do is go and show you the church. So it is important. Uh, it is there are sources of leadership in this community as well. If you talk to the priest, if you talk to the school teacher, they're like highly regarded people in the community. So if you're able to establish this partnership with these institutions, then you have a greater chance that your projects are gonna be successful. Well, so been... finally. Please, Danny. Sorry. I, we've hit 18 minutes, so I might. Oh, all right. Well, I'll leave you with the uh, contributions of this project in the slide and uh, all right, wonderful. Thank you. We may have some time at the end. Uh, there's a number of questions to uh, some which were already there. You probably saw before um, we commenced today. So you can uh, please feel free to answer some of them in the chat um, if you'd like to do it that way. Or perhaps if we've got some time at, at the end, if you've had a look at the questions, you can pick one or two that you'd like to speak to. Um, fantastic presentation. Thank you very much. Um, I have had the opportunity to do field work in Fiji, so I second your call that it's something that everyone should try and do in their life. Thank you very much, Denny. Thank you. Let's move on to our um, final speaker now. Hey, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Gayatri, and I am a master's student at the Australian National University. I am pursuing a Master of Environment and Resource Economics from the Crawford School of Public Policy. And this is basically my first attempt into academics or presenting my paper. So I hope you enjoy. So uh, my topic is developing pathways for sustainable development through localized action, where I focus on developing a pathway approach uh, which is not unidimensional, but multidimensional in nature. So uh, in order to understand my topic, I will first briefly touch upon the concept of sustainable development. Uh, it, was, it is defined as the development that meets the need of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. This is the most uh, commonly used definition in uh, Sustainable, of sustainable development. And it was first introduced in 1980 under the World Conservation Strategy and was later, uh, which later influenced the 1987 WCED report on our, com uh, our common future, also known as the Brundtland Report. So uh, the goals of sustainable development are manifested in the 17 SDG goals. So uh, uh, they are a continuation of the millennial development goals. So these were adopted for two different time frames. The MDGs were for two, from 2000 to 2015 and SDGs were from 2015 into 2030. And while the MDGs focus more on poverty reduction and aspects related to eradicating hunger, um, SDGs focus more on climate action, given that one of the current challenges faced in this decade is that of climate change. So moving ahead to my main topic, which is pathways approach to sustainability. So uh, sustainability is means different things for different people. And there is no one single solution which can solve the problem of sustainable development. There are multiple pathways for achieving them. So. Uh, Sustainable development lies at the heart, uh, lies at the intersection of economic, social, and environmental development, and it is highly contextual in nature. And solutions are often interconnected. Uh, a pathway can be defined as an act action strategy consisting with a particular notion of development. And uh, uh, the, while the more dominant pathways 
are rooted in political interests and economic value, there is a need to understand local voices and to consider pathways that focus on developing solution, local level solutions to a problem. So uh, I understand the pathways approach to sustainability based on a documentary, a documentary analysis. So the most, the most prominent approach is that by the Steps Institute in the UK, uh, so uh, which states that there is no single, singular notion to progress in relation to environment, technology, or development. For instance, in the example that I consider for the palm oil plantation workers, Development means that getting more revenue out of selling oil plant, oil palm plantations, but for the government of Indonesia, it might mean that um, transitioning away from palm oil plantation into more sustainable uh, sources, which generate uh, revenue. So uh, this is the steps approach. And the next part of it is frame analysis. So frame analysis combines the steps approach and the uh, steps approach as well. And it allows for exploring actors, beliefs, and perceptions. And lastly, as an alternative to the pathway approach is the idea of procedural, uh, procedural sustainability, which helps in identifying so, so important societal values, which can uh, help in bringing about a change. Uh, so moving ahead to my case study, which is deforestation in Indonesia. So I will give a brief background about the situation in the country and then move to the specific area which I have chosen. So India, Indonesia is one of the uh, places with the highest rate of deforestation in the world. The region is home to rich biodiversity and endemic plant species. It is the only place in the world which houses the Sumatran tiger, the orangutans and the elephants. Uh, and one of the main direct causes of deforestation in Indonesia are the large scale oil palm plantations. And they are mostly concentrated in the Sumatra and the Kalimantan region of the country. However, there is, has been an increasing trend in the rise of small scale agriculture. This is primarily on account of increasing sustainability standards in Sumatra and Kalimantan, which has led to industrial units shifting their plantation to small uh, to like small islands so the priority sdgs that i will be uh, talking about in my thing are the climate action and life on in land so deforestation in south sulawesi which is my main area of research so south sulawesi is rich in for, uh, a lot of forest types. There are around 14 different ecosystems which lead to the region having rich di uh, biodiversity and high endemic species. So in the year, uh, over 80% of South Sulawesi's forests are either completely gone or have degraded to some uh, degree. This is because of the government support for large scale logging and uh, agricultural pro uh, projects in the 1970s. And by 1990, only 30% of the total vegetation cover remained in this area. However, because of the rapid uh, development in the region during the, uh, during the later part of the 20th century, the uh, the, the region witnessed immense migration from urban areas, which converted large tracts of forest into, ca into cash crops such as coffee and cocoa. Uh, the nature of government regulations are basically top down in nature. In 2011, the government of Indonesia issued a moratorium to prohibit government from granting new forest concession licenses. However, these were mostly focused on large scale plantations and uh, this failed to take into account the rise in smallholder plantations. And uh, in South Sulawesi, small scale agriculture and conversion of forest to grasslands is one of the main drivers of deforestation. And yet there is no compliance mechanism for small scale agriculture and plantations. So applying the pathway-based approach to sustainability. Uh, so the pathways-based approach places the politics of sustainability at the heart of environmental management, given that there is no single solution or a pathway to sustainability in a complex and uncertain world. 
So I talk about the Maros Pankep Caste Forest, which is located 50 kilometer north of the Makassar city, which is the capital of South Sulawesi, and it is under serious threat from encroachment and illegal logging. Logging, uh, the encroachment has mo mostly been for growing corn and oil palm plantations. However, it's interesting to note that oil palm is mostly managed by large enterprises which have shifted them, their bases from Kalimantan and Sumatra to South Sulawesi. And there is a direct link between smallholder plantations and their industrial counterparts in the main regions. In this area, Buginese or the Bugis people are the indigenous people of South Sulawesi. They are usually engaged in subsistence farming, but now uh, have been also engaged in oil palm plantations and mostly favor growing corn, cocoa, and coffee. So the methodology for my research was mostly based on government reports and research papers. And these were the ones that I used. Uh, so I basically do a frame analysis in order to understand the beliefs of actors and what they value and what their perception of sustainability is in the region. So these were the five actors that I identified. The government of Indonesia, they, the, the challenge for them is to balance economic development with uh, deforestation for forest officials. They are an important impacting stakeholders through, uh, because they engage in systemic corruption and even their perception of sustainability is reduced deforestation, but their other needs take uh, precedence. Uh, then there is the Boogies tribe, which has been impacted and they have been constantly uh, blamed for increased level of deforestation. However, uh, people fail to take into account the impact that large industrial counterparts of, counterparts of small scale agriculturalists are having on these tribes. And then there is the local population, which is also impacted because there has been uh, instances of haze pollution. The NGOs which are uh, advocating for reducing uh, deforestation and biodiversity loss. So based on the frame analysis, the basic results that I derived were first that the localized, localized action remains completely absent as there is a disconnect between the dominant pathway and the locally desired pathways. Uh, the government has imposed a moratorium or, uh, for reducing forest loss from, uh, uh, from large scale uh, plantation, but has failed to put, implement such a scheme at the small scale level. This is because uh, government policies do not take into account multiple pathways and different framings. Uh, this means that basically small scale agriculture have different governing principles and uh, different approaches which the government uh, is not aware of and which results in no collaborative decision making. Then uh, second, in order to comply with the uh, sustainability standards in the dominant areas of deforestation, uh, there has been uh, a substitution of forest loss in these small regions. Lastly, I will consider the alternative pathways for development through local actions. So my first is increasing local participation in forest conservation. Uh, local people have a, a hold forests in high regards they, because they carry high cultural values and uh, they are interested, intrinsically interested in forest conservation. But given that they have no alternative sources of livelihood, uh, they move towards resource de uh, dependency. Hence, one alternative can be to employ local population in conserva uh, conservation efforts, which will also help in providing adaptive, uh, like uh, providing co benefits in terms of income generated from employment, and will help in the overall well being by helping in forest preservation. Secondly, by uh, there have been instances of systemic corruption in the system, in the uh, at the local uh, at the local governments in Indonesia. So, in uh, in having an informal checks and balance system in place, because uh, which is which focuses on informal networks of actors, and uh, this will also help because the local population is well worst with the situation, it will help in identifying encroachers and help in also providing data which can be used for implementing a future government policies. And also, lastly, um, 
not related to local action, but also there is a need to increasing the scope of uh, increasing the scope of the moratorium on for smallholder plantations, which have direct links with their industrial counterparts. However, I suggest that uh, it, it is important to give some certain con concessions to indigenous communities who are dependent on these plantations as their main source of livelihood. Lastly, for my conclusion, um, I will say that developing pathways requires understanding the beliefs and perceptions of local actors. There is no universal solution. Hence, uh, there is a need to move away from dominant pathways which focus on resource exploitation and which uh, are in the political interests of different groups. Uh, and in terms of in South Sulawesi, the home is rich to uh, home to rich biodiversity and endemic plant species. Um, uh, there is a lack of collaborative decision making and lack of indigenous representation, which is resulting in potential environmental conflicts, and hence a way to ensure local uh, local action would be uh, collabor through collaborative decision making and generating alternative sources of livelihood uh, so in order to ensure sustainable development. So this was my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Debbie. That's very interesting, and thank you also um, for taking time. We do have uh, five minutes before the end of our session. There's a few questions in the Q and A box, um, but it's a little bit difficult to discern uh, if they're directed to which speaker they're um, directed. I think there might be some questions still coming in for Danny. Um, I had one question, if I could, um, Piatri. In terms of the different actors that are involved, um, there's some work by uh, a guy named Timothy Mitchell around can the mosquito speak, um, in which case he's looking at sort of non role non-human actors and the non-human as actors. And then there's, that's quite an old piece, but then there's some much more contemporary writing around ideas like more than human development, where we look at um, non-human actors and I just wondered if um, you know that's been something you've been looking at or if that's outside of the scope of your current project um, so uh, uh, yeah non-human actors in terms of understanding the informal networks and the informal like structures which influence uh, the local actors that will I will be considering okay thank you um, so we've got just four minutes before we close. Um, I'll open it back up to everyone. I'll thank our speakers uh, once more for your presentations. Daniela or Siona, did you have any final uh, comments that you'd like to make? Um, any Anything we'd like to say before we finish up? You go ahead, Siona. No, I was going to say that you, you should probably do your last conclusion slide. <laughs> well, I think everyone had a couple seconds to see it, but um, no, just if you're interested in uh, projects of community-based adaptation or climate adaptation in the Pacific, feel free to contact me and I left in the last slide um, just a QR code for our center's website. So do reach out and get in touch if this is an area of research you're interested in. Right. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, three very interesting um, and somewhat intersecting um, presentations. So that was a, a very um, enjoyable and fascinating session. Thank you.